We know we eat to fuel our body, so why is every time I do that, I, I gotta be so sleepy? Why do I gotta be in a food coma every afternoon at 3 p.m. and drool all over my post-its? I don't wanna mess up my post-it system. So there's actually a variety of reasons that this can happen, and it can be kinda tricky to figure it out because it can be different from person to person. So in this video, not only are you gonna understand why you're going into a food coma, you're gonna understand the steps you can take to correct it. Let's jump in. TC Hill is not a doctor and does not claim to be a doctor or licensed in any type of medical field. Don't be an idiot and use anything heard on the show as medical advice. This information should be used for educational purposes only and you should contact your doctor for any medical advice. Now get off me. So in the comments section below, let us know which meal is it that you get the most sleepy after and what have you tried to correct this? And now they call this postprandial somnolence and like a fancy name is supposed to make us feel better about it. That doesn't really work out. Just tell me why I gotta be in a coma all the time. I wanna be energized after I eat. So what we're gonna do in this video is we're gonna talk about the five most common causes for feeling sleepy after you eat. And what we really need to jump into is the carbohydrate factor. So if you're eating starchy or high carbohydrate or processed or just a lot of junk food that is going to create a spike in blood sugar, we have to look at the factors of insulin and what insulin does. So when our blood sugar spikes too high, it also brings up insulin because the insulin is in charge of sweeping that glucose out of the bloodstream and into the cells so we can use it to create energy. The problem is this, when insulin goes high, it takes a lot longer than blood sugar for it to come down. So we can burn through the glucose in, in a couple of hours and now we're out of fuel, but insulin takes a lot longer for it to come down. This is problematic because while insulin is high, it blocks the ability for your body to access stored fat and burn it for fuel. So now this backup system of fuel that the body has all the time ready to go can't work. Your body can't access that stored fuel and now it just sits there and maybe it expands and now our pants don't fit. So it's really important to eat in a way that insulin is not going so high that it stays high for pretty much the rest of the day. As long as insulin is in a very high range, the body can't access that stored fat. So now we burn through our glucose, we have no more glucose left, but insulin is still too high for us to access stored fat and use that for fuel. So we have no fuel source left. Now we're gonna fall asleep on our desk and drool all over our clothes. This is why most people see that 3 p.m. coma because they don't have any fuel. Why, why would they be energized when they don't have fuel? This is also why a lot of people have a hard time losing weight because if you either don't have fuel, you're like, oh, maybe I need a little snack to give me a pick-me-up. Or a lot of people, when their body doesn't have any glucose and they can't access this backup fuel source, they'll get crazy cravings. So it's like, oh man, I gotta have Pop-Tart. So now they eat again, they spike their blood sugar, they spike their insulin before it ever has a chance to come down and their body can never move into that fat burning mode. So of course they're not gonna be energized and of course they're gonna be tired. Another version of this problem is eating excess protein, especially if you have a large meal with a whole lot of protein and not very much carbohydrates. When we eat a lot of protein, the body breaks that down into amino acids, but the body also uses insulin to process those amino acids so they can be used by the body. So if we have a large protein meal that breaks down into a lot of amino acids, the body needs a lot of insulin to process all those. The problem is, those high levels of insulin are also gonna sweep out all of your glucose in the bloodstream and wipe out that fuel source, leaving you with none. Now, some of these factors are not as problematic if someone's using a ketogenic diet and their body is in ketosis and has an easy way to access stored fat for fuel. That can remove that problem for a lot of people. That's not me saying that everybody should be on a ketogenic diet. That's not the case. It's only appropriate for some people. But with these higher protein meals like you might see someone do with a carnivore diet, a lot of them will do that well if they're doing it in a manner that allows their body to be in ketosis. But for most people who are not eating that way, a large protein meal without any carbohydrates with that can create this same type of crash because of the high insulin levels. So for people who are getting sleepy after these issues, the best thing to do is eat a more balanced meal and maybe consume more what we call medium carb foods. Things that have the carbohydrates that you might need, 
but the carbs are not so high that they create this huge spike and crash. Things like uh, sweet potatoes or yams or, or butternut squash or, or, or Brussels sprouts. These foods contain some carbohydrates, but not in such a way that it's going to spike and crash you like rice or pasta or bread or all these processed carbohydrates would. So when you can eat lower carb foods and include proteins with those foods and some fat as well, and you get that balanced meal, it keeps your blood sugar on a more even keel and doesn't spike insulin so high. The second common cause for the sleepy after meals syndrome, and I just made that up, but I, I like that name. Uh, the second most common cause is oxygen utilization issues. So when our bloodstream leans a little bit too much on the alkaline side, what happens is the Bohr effect kicks in. And we learned about this in the eighth grade science class, but then everybody forgot all about it. And the Bohr effect is a situation where when the blood leans too alkaline, oxygen can't get down to the tissues where it needs to be. You can't use that oxygen. So you have plenty of oxygen in your blood, it just can't get where it needs to be so that it can be used. And this is why all the pH gurus are creating a lot of problems for people when they're saying, hey, we all got to alkalize. We're going to die by Thursday if we don't alkalize. Because a lot of people are already leaning too far on the alkaline side. And when they take these steps to alkalize, they push their blood way too alkaline and then they have these oxygen utilization issues. If you want to learn more about that, we'll put a link to our video in the description below about why all the pH gurus are wrong. It's a fun video. So this can be a real big problem because when we eat food, especially protein, our body makes hydrochloric acid. And to make that hydrochloric acid, or, or HCL, which is stomach acid, to make that our bodies need minerals, especially chloride, to make hydrochloric acid. The body uses chloride to make that. So the body will pull this chloride out of the blood to make our hydrochloric acid to help us digest our food. This can be a problem because chloride is also a little bit acidic and helps to balance out the bloodstream and keep it from going too alkaline. But if somebody doesn't have a lot of mineral resources, the body will pull like all the chloride out of the blood to make its hydrochloric acid and then the blood will push too far on that alkaline side. So after a meal, if the body pulled all the chloride out of the bloodstream, it'll lean too alkaline and we create oxygen utilization issues and the person can be wiped out. This is usually problematic for someone whose blood is leaning too far on that alkaline side and we'll tell you how to check for that yourself a little bit later in the video. Or if a person has really low mineral resources. So fixing either of those issues can correct the sleepy after a meal issue if this is the underlying cause for you. That brings us right into the third common cause which is low resources. So to digest our food takes a lot of resources. It takes more resources to digest than just about anything that the body has to do. So if a person has low minerals or, or low resources, it can almost suck the life out of them just to break down a cheeseburger. The body's got to pull all the resources that's available to use during this digestive process. So it's very common for someone to have low minerals or low resources for a variety of reasons. One of those reasons is that the digestive process is not functioning correctly or well enough to break down the food so that the body can pull the minerals out of that food. So it's kind of a ripoff because you need all these minerals to be able to create hydrochloric acid and really digest your food and pull all the minerals out of your food. But your body also needs minerals to be able to make that hydrochloric acid. So a person can get stuck in this cycle of kind of broken digestion for a long time unless they correct things that are going wrong. Another level of this problem could be low digestive enzymes. Our, our body has kind of this stockpile of enzymes and as we age, we kind of deplete those and we don't always replenish them. Uh, the, the enzymes are not as available on our food sources as they were you know, 50 years ago, so we can kind of run out. And these enzymes are really needed to help us finish that breakdown process and pull all the nutrients out of our food. So a person could supplement with digestive enzymes and they could also take steps to either lift their minerals or fix any digestive malfunctions that may be restricting their ability to pull all the minerals out of their food. So those are some steps that you can take to correct the issue if that's the underlying cause for you. Problem number four is that a person can be pushed too far into this parasympathetic side of the autonomic nervous system. Our autonomic nervous system kind of runs a lot of functions that kind of go on behind the curtains. We don't really have to think about them happening. Our heart just beats, you know, our, our, our digestive system just kind of functions. We don't have to say digest, you know, it just kind of happens. So there's two sides of this system. There's the sympathetic, which is the fight or flight state, and then, then there's the parasympathetic side, which is the rest and digest state. 
So when we start to digest our food, the body kind of shifts a little bit into this parasympathetic state so that we can properly digest our food, and it happens to also be the state where we rest. Here's the problem. If someone's digestion is not working correctly, the body will often push as far into this parasympathetic state as it can just to kind of boost its ability to break down food any way that it can. So when it pushes really hard into this parasympathetic state, that's also the rest state. So we can get a little tired in that state because that's the state when the body should be resting. So to correct this, we want to see, all right, are we leaning too far in this parasympathetic side? And if we are, we can take steps to improve that imbalance or we can take steps to improve digestion if there's digestive malfunctions. And the final reason we'll talk about in this video are food sensitivity issues. If a person's having a food sensitivity, then that means that when they eat that food, they're having a reaction to that food. So a lot of these sensitivities come about because their digestion is not breaking the food down into elemental nutrients. The, the food is still showing up in the bloodstream as food. Like, hey, I'm a peanut butter sandwich. Well, peanut butter sandwich shouldn't make it into the bloodstream. That peanut butter sandwich should be broken down into vitamins and minerals and amino acids and, and dietary fats. And then those micronutrients should go into the bloodstream. So when it's not being broken down properly, sometimes the food entering into the bloodstream, if it's leaking through the intestinal tract, shows up as a food and then the body views that as an invader. So now every time you eat that food, the body goes to war against a peanut butter sandwich. Well, going to war against an invader takes a lot of resources and a lot of energy. And if all of our energy is going towards a battle with a peanut butter sandwich, then that's not going to leave you much energy to get through the rest of your day. So a lot of times a person may need to figure out which foods are creating problems and then avoid those foods. And then while they're avoiding those foods, they can take steps to improve any digestive malfunctions so they may eventually be able to go back to consuming those foods again. So you can see there's a wide variety of issues that a person may have food coma going on all the time. And it's really about looking at you and your unique bioindividuality to figure out which issue is going on for you. So we have a totally free digestion course, it's online, and it kind of walks you through some simple self-tests that you can do on your physiology at home using tools you can pick up at a pharmacy or a health food store. And walking through these tests will help you figure out, okay, am I leaning too far on this parasympathetic side? Maybe is my bloodstream already leaning too alkaline, so every time I have a meal, it really pushes that side and I get wiped out because I can't use oxygen. So it helps you kind of look at your physiology and figure out where things may be going wrong. It also helps you look, am I having digestive malfunctions? And if I am, what steps can I take to improve those? So we'll put the link to that totally free course in the description below. But for now, if you're having any type of digestive symptoms like burping, bloating, diarrhea, constipation, acid reflux, any of that kind of stuff, watch our video on understanding digestive troubles to give you more insights on steps you may be able to take right now. I can't wait to hear about your results.